Hare Om Namaha. We need to understand Prabhupada's movement in terms of the applicable time and scale perspective. We need to understand its superficial and hopefully temporary degradation, its current deplorable state, in terms of a time scale which differs from that of the human experience. The time scale of any branch of the Hare Krishna movement, whether it remains bona fide or becomes a deviated institution, is of greater length since a human's lifespan is much shorter. When the plug of a fan is pulled out of the socket in a Krishna movement, the blades do not immediately stop spinning. Indeed, in the first few seconds after being unplugged, they are still going as fast as they were while the fan was still plugged in. A few seconds in fan time for an occult movement is measured in years. A genuine spiritual movement is an occult entity, and it remains so when and after it deviates. How a spiritual movement is an occult entity and how it degenerates and dies is to be considered in terms of its own time scale. When the death blow hits, the end ensues in time. These things may appear to be accidental, but the law of accident is actually not applicable to these occult entities. What you need to understand about so-called ISKCON in this connection is that its destruction was a controlled demolition. For occult movements, another perspective has to be developed. We must consider the Golden Age. We are still in the early stages of Lord Chaitanya's Golden Age of the Hare Krishna movement. We are in, and have been in for some time, a particularly difficult juxtaposition of it at this moment and the Western branch of it, which we have experienced for the last four decades, is embroiled in a fierce internecine war. Nevertheless, the Chaitanya tree is going to eventually prevail. Quote, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has forecast that this Hare Krishna mantra will be heard in every nook and cranny of the globe. He is God, so it will happen. That is a fact. So if we take advantage, then we may take the credit, but if we do not, someone else will." Unquote. This is an excerpt from a letter dictated on November 4, 1970 by Srila Prabhupada to one of his leading secretaries. In the same year and time, he sent an almost identical message, via snail mail, of course, to two other leading secretaries. This excerpt does not fall into the category of a prediction. It instead is in the category of prophecy, which cannot be reversed, and as stated, it will happen. The question is when, and the question is also by whom or by what group. It will certainly transpire via the Gaudiya Vaishnava Parampara, because Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda founded that disciplic succession in the late 15th century. It is their golden age. However, the corporate version of the Krishna institution as it is known today may not wind up being the vehicle to actuate the prophecy on this planet. It could be someone else and that means it could be someone else not in any way connected to the fabricated so-called, air quotes, ISKCON Confederation. Indeed, it must be. It could be someone else not in any way connected to the Gaudiumat or the Gaudium mission. It will not be connected to Neomat, and it certainly will not be connected to Ritvik heresy. Lord Chaitanya's Golden Age began, as already mentioned, in the late 15th century. As such, we are a bit over 500 years into it. 
It is scheduled to last for many thousand years. So most of its duration remains. Yet during the just over five centuries in which it has been running, there have been some very rough patches. It had all but disappeared from the planet, including even in India during much of the 18th century. This was primarily due to it having been degraded, watered and dumbed down by that dreadful Sahajia phenomenon. It was doing quite well in America in the latter half of the 60s and throughout much of the 70s. Its weight was being felt, but it has as an institution or an organized entity, meaning a bona fide institution, more or less disappeared at this time. We are not referring to the physical plane here, although it is diminished at that level also. We are instead referring to its influential presence on higher planes. There are distinct reasons for this. And if you have been following our articles, videos, and audio podcasts for the last three decades, you are aware, at least to a significant extent, why and how this deplorable situation has transpired and continues to transpire. In order to gain perspective on all of this, you have to know the A, B, C, D of spiritual science, or if you prefer, devotional science. A guru is a very special man because he is a very perfect man. A Vaishnava guru is the best perfect man, but there are stages or degrees of spiritual elevation and power in relation to genuine gurus in the Vaishnava parampara. Specifically, there are three kinds of gurus, Bharatma Pradarshika, Shiksha, and Diksha. All of them are genuine, but with different functions. All of them are fixed in spiritual service and purity. All of them are very perfect men, but not all of them are at the same level of spiritual perfection. Prabhupada established a branch of Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement in the West in the mid-60s. It spread and grew very fast, yet it was only partially successful in his eyes, and rightfully so. Prabhupada was the actual Vartma Pradarshika guru for every disciple who became initiated into his branch of the disciplic succession coming from the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya or school. He wanted while he was still physically present, that his leading men become initiating gurus in order to increase the number of devotees quite early in his movement. In a letter dated January 2nd, 1969, Prabhupada dictated this excerpt to two of his leading secretaries, quote, I want that all of my spiritual sons and daughters will inherit this title of Bhaktivedanta so that the family transcendental diploma will continue through the generations. Those possessing the title of Bhaktivedanta will be allowed to initiate disciples. Maybe by 1975, all of my disciples will be allowed to initiate and increase the numbers of the generations, unquote. Please note, Prabhupada was still physically manifest in 1977 and in reasonably good health. Everyone expected that he would be so in 1975, and he was. The excerpt means that he wanted as many Diksha gurus as possible to have emerged from his initiated disciples by 1975, which was only six years up the road from when this excerpt was dictated. However, his disciples would have to be qualified. They would have to be very perfect men, since the guru must be a very perfect man. Quote, he guides him so that he will, his life, his progress of life, may be systematic. Now, 
To take such guidance means the spiritual master should also be a very perfect man. Otherwise, how can he guide? Unquote. This statement was recorded from an informal platform lecture which Prabhupada delivered in New York City on March 2nd, 1966, before he had any initiated disciples and before he had incorporated ISKCON. As such, this is an essential and fundamental qualification stressed from the very beginning. Question, did his disciples live up to it? Near the end of that aforementioned pivotal year of 1975, there were indications that they were not so doing. Consider this excerpt from a letter to one of his governing body commissioners dated August 4, 1975, quote, If one does not follow the regulative principles, then he will leave. That is a fact. The GBC should all be the instructor gurus. I am the initiator guru, and you should be the instructor guru by teaching what I am teaching and doing what I am doing. This is not a title, but you must actually come to this platform. This I want, unquote. There is much to glean from this excerpt. First, although somewhat indirect, there are indications in it that many of his leaders were leaving at this time. Ironically, the letter was addressed to one of his most prominent sannyasis, one who had been favorably nicknamed by Prabhupada. He was a pet disciple, yet he was engaged in illicit sex with a god sister in the temple that he controlled at that time. When the affair was exposed, he left. He visited Prabhupada afterwards in Honolulu, and his divine grace begged him to come back, but he never did. In other words, the leaders of the movement were mostly not following very well in the mid-70s, and some of them were plotting. Prabhupada says, that all of his governing body commissioners should be shiksha gurus. Why should they become? Why did he not simply state that they were? It is because they weren't. He wasn't going to give certifications. He wasn't going to issue institutional appointments. Shiksha guru, as stated clearly, was not a title. It was a realized attainment which allowed the leader to function as he was supposed to in the movement. To make this more clear, his movement could not function well unless there were shiksha gurus in it. However, what does Prabhupada say at the very end of the excerpt? He says, this I want. If you want something, then that means that you do not have it. This is basic logic. We are not even talking about initiating spiritual masters or diksha gurus here. We are talking about instructing gurus, which is not as special a function as a diksha guru, since every diksha guru is automatically a shiksha guru, but not vice versa. Do not forget, in that aforementioned letter earlier in our podcast from 1969, Prabhupada was hoping that all of his disciples would be qualified as Diksha Gurus in his physical presence, not merely Shiksha Gurus. Diksha Gurus. However, they weren't even Shiksha Gurus in late 1975, as it turns out. By that time, there was plenty of evidence that his movement might not turn the corner. What to speak of what went down during the last two years of Prabhupada barely being with us on the physical plane. What transpired after the 1978 zonal imposition was a dead bounce. You can compare it, if you like, to the Battle of the Bulge of late 1944 and early 1945 in World War II. What is transpiring now 
in so-called ISKCON, continues the dead bounce. This is because Prabhupada's branch, as an international institution, received a death blow in the last week of March, 1978. The zonal scam was then instituted worldwide during April of that year, and it was implemented by force and deception everywhere. The growth of cancer cells is still categorized as a growth. The growth of a tumor, tumor is still categorized as a growth. The Nazi regime broke out in late 1944 and began taking back territory. However, the bulge it created on the map of Western Europe then was a dead bounce because that military effort of the Third Reich was dependent upon temporary fuel depots set up by the Allies in their march to the Rhine. The Soviet Union had cut off the fuel supplies from Romania, so the Nazi war machine had to depend upon enemy fuel depots in order to keep their mechanized battalions operational. The Allies realized this, so they burned them in advance of this later assault, and the German army ran out of fuel. It was only a matter of time before VE Day ensued. Similarly, all that has ensued after the disappearance of Prabhupada is a dead bounce. A mere four months after he left the scene, the major deviation that the vitiated GBC set into motion amounted to nothing more than a dead bounce. Deviated pseudo-spiritual movements do not get nourishment from the Guru Parampara. They are instead dependent upon their newly created egregors, astral egregors. Pure devotional movements never want to and never do receive energy from astral egregors. The dead bounce of so-called Iskan is part of the flotsam behind the actual boat. That ship has sailed. It's gone. There have thus far been three major transformations of an egregor-dependent movement. Each of them provided some new but temporary energy in order to keep the scam appearing to run well. All of that is being exposed every day on the internet now, and such has been the case for years. People are catching on. When they do so to the breaking point, to the point of critical mass, they no longer will be willing to serve the make show. As a result, so-called ISKCON loses more energy. It is still run on the dead bounds from the 70s, although that can only last for some time before it peters out. Those blades on the unplugged fan will eventually stop. The music of chants in so-called ISKCON is slowing. The Hindu hodgepodge, the third transformation, is winding down and at its fag end. The Western Hindu is creating his own temples at this time in America, no longer relying upon the white elephants to set up all of that celebratory stage and scenario for him. Whatever dead bound still avails, it will continue to lose power because it will not be as potent as the previous transformation. It will not supply as much energy, nor will that energy last as long. PowerPoint presentations in academic settings and semi-spiritual retreats can only go so far. These are popular in postmodern cults, but a genuine devotional movement can never be dependent upon the popularity of Vox Populi. Where's the spiritual science? It is not only not known by its so-called teachers, its air quotes, ISKCON Brahmins, but even if known, it's risky to teach it. Teaching anything that is bona fide risks the listening and paying audience to question why all of that science was dumbed down and previously misrepresented as it was warped in processes adopted by so-called ISKCON over the previous decades leading up to the New Age Seminar. The dead bounce 
can be compared to the Battle of Kurukshetra on the Kuru side of the ledger. Initially, they had an 11 to 7 advantage in terms of fighting men and battlefield numbers. They had the greatest warrior on their side and arguably the second greatest warrior as well. They won a big victory on day one and it was in a rout. The Bhishma Parva eventually came to an end. That can be compared to the zonal era, which was ultra high energy in the beginning, but was laid low primarily due to infighting and scandals. Next came the Drona Parva. It still augured an eventual Kuru victory. After all, Drona was the great warrior who had taught all the Pandavas best fighters. Yet Drona was decapitated by a Pandava lieutenant as he laid down his weapons on the battlefield, being somewhat indirectly lied to by Yudhishthir under the order of Lord Krishna that Drona's son had died in the battle. The music of chants was slowing for the Kurus after that. The Drona Parva can be compared to the second transformation of the Collegiate Compromise, brought in by Professor Blueblood and his powerful position papers in the mid-80s, the second transformation manifested a new energy of pseudo-excitement, as it supposedly was going to uproot all the nations. The fading fast first transformation of the great pretenders and those who follow in their, followed in their footsteps and got voted in as institutional gurus in the early 80s, that first transformation was grinding to a halt However, like Drona, the new dispensation had an Achilles heel. The heavy-duty collectors out on quote-unquote book distribution lost their enthusiasm to pick the bone and bring it on home. They had lost their worshipable Mahabharat as he had either been mothballed or ostracized or busted down in rank. That created, in but a few years, a revenue decline that was very substantial, threatening the new era of transformation. Now, in the Kurukshetra saga, next came Karna. He was, for all practical purposes, equal to Arjun in fighting ability, particularly in archery. The numbers were now equal on the battlefield, and momentum to victory could still swing either way. The Karna Parva was not as great as the previous two, but it was still powerful. It can be compared to the current third transformation, the Hinduization of so-called ISKCON. The dead bounce is slowing in that deviated, air quotes, ISKCON movement, but the Hindu has provided needed revenue for decades now. As some of you know, Karna while he was unarmed and changing the wheel of his chariot stuck in the mud, was slain by Arjuna against all Kshatriya codes of warfare, again under the order of Lord Krishna, Arjuna's chariot driver. When the Hindu hodgepodge runs its course, coming soon to a theater near you, the dead bounce in so-called Iskand will take a major hit and resort, pun intended, to the next concoction. As far as the Shalya Parva is concerned, the writing was already on the wall. The Kurus would soon be defeated, and that was self-evident. The fact that Yudhishthir could kill Shalya straight up indicated this. Yudhishthir, although very important, as he was to become the emperor, was not in the same league as the really great warriors on the battlefield. Similarly, fancy presentations in collegiate settings and the coming colorful and opulent seminars, retreats, and resorts will be a far cry from what actually energized Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement back in the day. The jig will be up for the warlocks with dundas soon after the fourth transformation runs its futile course. Tatvamasi.
Yet, the air quotes ISKCON leaders remain undaunted in pushing the long con. They've been engaged in it for many decades and it was still working. This is because the devotees since the late 70s have been played time and time again. It was the plan from the beginning. TKG knew that as long as he could keep Prabhupada from being asked point blank whether or not the Ritviks appointed in July 1977 would automatically convert into Diksha Gurus upon his disappearance, the wool could be pulled over everybody's eyes quite easily. And everybody got played because the deception turned out to be ultra effective. They got played because TKG and his cohorts merged the appointment of mere Ritviks into the appointment of Diksha Gurus. It sure helped their cause that Swami B.R. Sridhar chimed in with Ritvik Acharya, then it becomes as good as Acharya. In the spring of 1978, while being interviewed by various so-called ISKCON leaders. However, it was all a con. The idea that a Ritvik is automatically qualified as even any kind of guru, what to speak of an initiating spiritual master or Diksha guru, that is called a presupposition. It is both unsound and unsupported. Prabhupada never validated any such thing, and there are reasons for that. The chief reason is that the idea is not true since it's a false supposition. TKG made sure that no one could ask the question as to whether the appointment of Ritviks was Prabhupada's allegedly covert way of recognizing them as gurus. You do not carry on a disciplic succession by such covert means. TKG was urged by one of his good buddies that died in the wool air quotes ISKCON party man, to get his conclusion clarified. However, his proud and overconfident reply was that he knew Prabhupada's intention in appointing those Ritviks. Where have we heard that before? Of course, in retrospect, we now all know beyond a shadow of a doubt that those 11 men were never genuine gurus. They proved that beyond contention via what they did when they imitated Uttama in their artificial and unauthorized Acharya zones. However, if they had been gurus in the second week of July 1977, then why would Prabhupada have appointed them as Ritviks? He would not have done so. Instead, he would have recognized them as genuine gurus and empowered them to initiate. He wanted Diksha Gurus by 1975, so why would he not want them in 1977? If they were Gurus, he would have given them the order. The appointment or recognition document would have been of initiating spiritual masters, not Rithics. They would have been authorized to immediately test and accept new people for initiation in order to expand the Hare Krishna movement. They were appointed as Ritviks because they were not qualified to be Diksha Gurus. Prabhupada confirmed in April of 1977 that no one was qualified. Ironically, that was TKG in Bombay, who directly stated that he understood the statement according to its obvious meaning. Then one month later, Prabhupada informed all of the assembled GBC members in his room at the Krishna Balaram Center that in order for someone to be guru in his movement, it had to be, quote, by my order, unquote. He never officially gave that order to anybody. You do not carry on a disciplic succession by covertly giving the order, allegedly, via appointing Ritviks who then allegedly become gurus after the spiritual master departs manifest physical presence. However, TKG knew it well that there was no order. 
He revealed that with another great pretender, Hong Sududa, sitting next to him in December 1980 at the Pyramid House in Topanga Canyon. He knew the whole time, but he also knew that he could play the long con and the devotees would buy it, and that's exactly what went down. When the propaganda came out that Prabhupada appointed 11 new gurus, which he certainly did not, no devotee in the movement questioned it. It was all a big lie, but no one could comprehend that it was that. Until the early 80s, that is. That's how a long con works. Nobody is able to spot it when it is put into gear. You could argue that Siddha did, but he took the title Prabhupada in the spring of 1978. Prabhupada never named a successor, although if there was one, he would have recognized him, and how wonderful that would have been for our branch and for the Golden Age. It was not to be because no one was qualified. If Siddha did spot the long con, he did not contribute much to upending it by initiating another con of his own. Remember, the long con accomplished its immediate goal. That goal was to fill all of the centers with new men initiated by the great pretenders in their zones of their own, own unauthorized making. That the vitiated GBC had its fingerprints all over the long con is plain to see. However, just as obvious is the fact that those 11 men dominated the influence within the board. Indeed, they created their own untouchable board within the GBC in order to remain prophylactic against it if it ever turned on them, which it eventually did anyway. It did so rather soon, as in the mid-80s. However, by that time, the long con had driven out, usually indirectly, but sometimes directly, most of Prabhupada's initiated disciples and replaced them with their own disciples. That the appointment that never was, the essence of the long con, became exposed to some limited extent in the early 80s could not prevent the damage that are, had already gone down. The gurus had put their own people in place and were dominating all of the centers. Success of the long con was more or less guaranteed at that time. This was proven in 1987. If the vitiated GBC was not contaminated, it would have upended the whole scam by returning to square one. The initiations from 1978 to 1987 would have been properly labeled Asara. The high-flying pretenders would not have been busted down to so-called Madhyams. They would have been exposed to Sahajas and forced to openly recant or be excommunicated. So to speak, the Western Gunditja Mandir would have been completely cleaned. But it wasn't really cleaned at all. The second transformation of the Collegiate Compromise replaced the first transformation of the 11 Great Pretender Zonals. Most devotees bought into the second transformation and they got played again. The Long Con still had legs in the mid 80s. The dead bounce still had some bounce left. The chief problem of the second transformation was its inability to keep the collecting sector of the newcomers enthusiastic. These newcomers got ultra amped up in worshiping their so-called Uttamas during the first transformation. Yet the godmen were nothing but Sahajas at best. Intensity and enthusiasm still gets temporary results, even when unsound. Those collectors were the guys and dolls taking amphetamines, if necessary, in order to stay out on the collection for 14 hours or more a day in order to pick the bone and bring it on home. They required their great guru, their Uttama, their wonderful charismatic leader, in order to undertake all of that austerity. 
Now with the second transformation, either ostracizing some of the godmen or busting down the rest to the so-called status of mudhims, the shallow newcomers, all improperly initiated, lost their mojo and became discouraged. They mostly remained in so-called ISKCON, but were no longer fired up enough to hit it out on the street and in the parking lots. That meant a huge loss of revenue which also meant that a solution had to be found in order to fill a big hole. You can't just close down temples, although Iskand Berkeley did just that as part of its short-term solution. Oh, but something was waiting in the wings. The long con could be continued via yet another change. Quote, gradually the Krishna consciousness idea will evaporate. Another change Another change. Every day, another change. Stop all this. Simply have kirtan, nothing else. Don't manufacture ideas, unquote. Dated November 5th, 1972. This is an important excerpt from a letter, perhaps you could consider it a chastisement, to a homosexual leader who as a middle-aged man later died of AIDS. Still, he was prominent for a while in Prabhupada's branch. The excerpt was relevant then, and it remained relevant throughout all of the transformations that ensued after Prabhupada left the scene. The third transformation of the Hinduization of the Western Krishna movement brought in needed revenue, but at a cost. It certainly was a change, just the kind that Prabhupada had warned about in the early 70s conducting Hindu wedding ceremonies in front of open iskandis. That's called an unauthorized change. Kar puja is not only an unauthorized change, but an absurdity. Again, in front of open deities, inviting the congregation of devotees and guests to delight in the colorful charade of the Hindu dance troupe was and is nothing but a manufactured idea. Yet many, if not most, went along with this new Hindu hodgepodge, and they all got played again. Neither money nor popularity is a key to the success of a su successful spiritual institution or movement. Official charisma of leading party men is also not at all essential, and it cannot even be considered a key to success. Vairagya is important. Jnana is important. Realizing that knowledge, vigyana or wisdom is important. Yet we must always remember that the key to the success or failure of Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement must be realized Brahmins. Prabhupada did not come to America to train fighters. The fighting spirit was already ingrained in this country, part and parcel of a culture and civilization steeped in the lower modes. Have you ever read Prabhupada's first written document after he arrived on America's shores? He was bemoaning how everyone here was steeped in the lower modes. He almost projected despair that any of them could take the Krishna consciousness, the Krishna consciousness he had arrived in America to bring to them. Another way of saying the same thing is that he came here to make Brahmins. Brahmins are supposed to be as far as possible in the mode of goodness. We need to know what a Brahmin's qualities are. First, even before that, we need to know what is the preliminary goal of bringing disciples out of the lower modes and into the mode of goodness. This initial goal, and please note, it is not the final goal, is to become fixed in the mode of goodness, as clearly delineated in the Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Text 19, Tada rajas tamo bhavaha, kama lobha tayashchaye, chete tair navid thang, stitang sattve prasiditi. Quote, at that time, consciousness becomes unaffected by passion and ignorance, along with lust, greed, and everything else connected to these lower modes, and he becomes fully satisfied, fixed in goodness." Unquote. 
As per the previous verse to this, text 18, quote unquote, at that time, which is in verse 19, refers to the mode of goodness reaching a stage where almost all that is troublesome to the heart has been removed, yet some of it is still present. As such, not everything of the lower modes was removed at the stage spoken of in text 18. However, it is all completely eradicated from the heart at the stage delineated in the next verse, which I just described above. Please note the term stittam sattve. This is not just the mode of goodness. Instead, it is higher than that. It denotes the Brahman being fixed in the mode of goodness. This should not be confused with a much higher state of consciousness known as Shuddha Sattva, which is spoken of continuously in devotional literature and in all Vaishnava sacred texts. Nevertheless, Stitta Sattva is an advanced state. Indeed, anyone who reaches it can be considered a perfect man. Anyone who is actually fixed in the mode of goodness is a perfected Brahman, although there are higher states for him in order to become completely perfect, which is known as Siddha. This Stitta Sattva is the preliminary goal of anyone initiated as a Brahman in our branch of the Guru Parampara. And as you have probably intuited, it is at this stage wherein Prabhupada can order his disciple to become a spiritual master as a Diksha Guru. First, however, let us consider the Brahman who is attempting to achieve Stittam Sattva. The Brahman, the man who has been genuinely initiated as a Brahman by his divine grace in the Guru Parampara. Shamo Damastapahak Shaucham Shantir Arjavam Evacha Gyanam Vigyanam Astikyam Ramakarma Svavajam. Quote Peacefulness, self control, austerity, cleanliness, tolerance, honesty, knowledge, wisdom, and theism. These are the natural qualities born of the actions of a Brahman. Unquote. That's directly from Bhagavad Gita. 18th chapter. Remember, these are the qualities required for a Brahman in order to reach Stitta Sattva. First, he has to have these qualities, then he can reach Stitta Sattva. When he reaches Stitta Sattva, in which he is perfected at a preliminary stage, He's a realized Brahman. Please note the quality of Arjavam, honesty. A synonym for Arjavam is sincerity. Please ask yourself these questions. Were the leaders of Prabhupada's branch, those who introduced and implemented the deviated zonal imposition, were they actually sincere when they did so? Were they sincere? Were they honest when they falsely claimed that Prabhupada had appointed them as Diksha Gurus? Were they sincere when those godmen pretended to be Uttama Otikaris? They took worship, not only from their own recruited new fools and unfortunates, but they took worship also from their own god brothers and god sisters. Were they honest when they agreed with Swami B.R. Sridhar that, quote, rip the kacharya, then it becomes as good as acharya, unquote. Were they even sincere within themselves when they deluded themselves to believe, quote, just put on the uniform and you will become the soldier? Negative. They were not. Smoke disturbs. Fire serves. First deserve, then desire. The New Age motto of imitate and become is not authorized in our line of Guru Parampara or in any Parampara were those 11 men and all who followed them actually honest people? Did they possess that essential quality of Arjavam? Even if, even if they had achieved formal initiation, did they live up to it? Were they genuine Brahmins? And then, what to speak of, were they Stittasattva? Which leads to the chief question, doesn't it? Were they gurus? 
When all hell broke loose in the late 70s, did the 11 great pretenders possess the minimum qualification to be guru, even as a shiksha guru? It was all nothing more than a long con. If we are honest within ourselves, the answer to all of these questions is the same as much as it is self-evident, because the questions answer themselves. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. We have all been played for decades, up to the point that we still have bought into it, some of us. We should stop buying into it, and we should stop being played right now. The dead bounce will thus come to its deserved end. So-called ISKCON is not going to fulfill the prophecy that Prabhupada made back in the early 70s, but someone else will. After he departed, and even before he left the scene, the whole thing was a controlled demolition. ISKCON style. And always remember that Humpty was pushed. Sadeva Samyan. <laughs>